the gal that owns this plays it a lot, <laughs> which is testimony enough. Um, but it needs some TLC. So it's an honor to work on something like this. Um, How old is it? This one was built in 1985, the last of the Chuck Oars. The very last one. <laughs> the very last one. He knew what he loved, and he did what he loved the best I've ever seen. He always had ideas in his head about how he was going to invent something. Or... Um, he liked something and he wanted to learn how to do that and that's what he'd do and he just he wasn't one of those people that would talk about it if he'd do it these antler bone nuts are kind of hard to file it's some of the hardest stuff i've ever found we'll try stringing it well, this guitar was built in roughly 1980. it took chuck a year to build it i watched him in his shop uh, every night he would put in and glue in one piece of wood or a strut inside of the guitar and set it and leave it for 24 hours. So it was, yeah, it was a year to build this guitar. He'd have all sorts of um, pieces of exotic wood that he would like secretly show you, whether it was some extraordinary piece of koa wood or maple or cherry wood. The, the shafts come in vertically this way. In a normal guitar, they come in the other way. So this is built like a classical orchestral instrument. <laughs> he said it was... Uh, the loudest badass guitar that he'd ever made in acoustic and he said it was meant to be played like hell. His dad was a train robber. He was a, a hobo and a train robber. He left their family when he was a little boy. Um, and left uh, my grandma to fend for herself and with her kids. And basically, he decided to become a professional train robber. He was famous for it. My dad didn't see him for years and years and years and years. And then he had kids of his own, didn't know where his dad was, hadn't had any idea. And we were, this was before my parents got divorced, probably very shortly before. We saw a front page paper with a picture of my dad's dad in it, talking about that he was a train robber and that he was dead. He had passed away. So that was my dad's like first in years, you know, idea of finding out where his dad was and what happened and here he is dead in the paper. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, but that just goes to say, I mean, that's kind of the story of my dad's life. It was crazy, effed up, neurotic, emotional, and and so he managed to make it what it was. This is a bass like almost any other. Um, the only real difference being is uh, a little different body shape. Uh, it's just done more for uh, aesthetics and uh, today's market I think more than anything else um, I wanted to do it differently uh, I think I have uh, I've experimented a great deal with uh, different styles of pickups this that hardware now uh, I'm not terribly happy with what I've done so far I'm going to change it again as a guitar player I can sit in a lot of instances, it drives my wife nuts because I think we were, we were in Anaheim and there were 
It was at the Walt Disney place yep. and oh, yeah. things. And so there were some kids out playing through this like amusement park area, I think. They have a tram that runs around through everything and such. And so we were walking along. We were a couple of blocks away. And I said, somebody's playing. It's it's a 335, semi-hollow body. And he's probably playing it through Fender Twin Reverb Amp. We get up there and questioning the sound because it was a little Turned out it was an Epiphone, yeah, but, but it was an Epiphone 335. Epiphone 335 yep. played through a Fender Twin Reverb. She was saying, I hate it when you do that stuff. You're always listening to this stuff. And so you, got you ever just stop listening? And just, no. No. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of fancy metalwork on this, and I really don't know where Charlie got all the pieces to do this. The armrest, the fancy adjusting nut, and all the fluid release pieces here that go around the edge make this really a pretty hefty banjo. If you were to lift this, you, it's much heavier than the other one I have. Also the fifth string capo here is rather unique. You can slide that up and down for a fifth string capo. He uh, did put his name up here in the abalone. And another little fleur de lis up here also. It starts with Prince. Being in Chuck shop and with you know hard to remember one two three other guys and he's in the back room and I'm waiting on Chuck to uh, cut a piece of wood for me glue it together and, and start working on one of my bases <laughs> Fires up that bandsaw with his beer in his hand. And he holds on to my wood. <laughs> and he gets about, I don't know, six foot long. Drinks that beer, sets it down, holds that wood out in front of him, about 10 feet from that bandsaw, and goes, here's how you cut wood. And he goes at a run. Just runs that thing right into the bandsaw. Yeah! Perfectly straight. Holds the two pieces together and said, there you go. Well, Chucky made all these pieces on his milling machine and his lathe. And uh, he showed me how he did it. And that's where I first got my first piece of actually milling. I've been an engine builder all my life. But I never made pieces this small. And it was just so fascinating to me that he was able to do that. And so, so when he showed me how to do it, do it, I was just amazed. And so from that point on, me and Chuck were just friends. He had his mad chemist hat on a lot of the time. And he was, you know, he'd go, look at this. Look at this as a concept. And then before you know it, he's going, look at this as a thing in his hands. And now look at it in the guitar and how it works. So that was the delight of this guy because it wasn't just some harebrained idea there was something really behind it and before you know it he had caused it to come into being and it was working and doing doing innovative stuff all right Excellent tone. Well, sir, it's yours. Wonderful. Check it out.